to host this, this event here uh, at Vivendi uh, during the, this specific week uh, we had in, uh, in Paris, uh, where was old ISMIR event, uh, gathering more than 400 data scientists uh, specialized on music. And we thought it was very interesting to go a little bit further from the uh, scientific aspects, process of the data in music and to discuss about the value it can generate for media. So this is the, the purpose of this, uh, this event today. Uh, I would like to, to give a, a, a big thank you as well to the sponsors of uh, this webinar series, uh, Mediametry, Deezer, RCS, INA, Audion, Single Spot, VR Connections, and uh, La Lette Pro de la Radio, together with uh, Broadcast Associates, uh, who makes possible to have this event live stream on this uh, brand new platform called uh, Connect On Air. Uh, we can uh, give you a few words about this. This is a, a new platform to uh, to gather, like a media, uh, all the information for the professional of radio and digital audio, um, a mix of uh, uh, live video, uh, for example, this event, and uh, also uh, uh, video on demand, especially um, the video of the past event, uh, the replay, uh, you will uh, be able to, uh, uh, to access. And this is a hub also. So this is a, a meeting place for all the professionals. This is the, the launching today, uh, but it will evolve uh, over the, the next months until uh, the European Radio and Digital Audio Show, uh, which is the, the event we are preparing for end of January, three days in Paris uh, at Grand Hall de la Villette. Uh, more than 6,000 uh, uh, professional, uh, radio professional who attended uh, this event last year. Uh, big part international. This year, uh, uh, Spain will be, uh, uh, Hispanic countries uh, will be the the um, invited uh, guests, let's say. Uh, so three days uh, full of uh, presentation and with uh, more than 120 exhibitors as well. Um, so this event is also a way to, uh, to prepare the Salon de la Radio. Um, just uh, uh, before we to getting a, a presentation by Ismir uh, about what is Ismir and what are the, uh, the tendencies and uh, uh, some of the conclusion over the last days and the, the new trends that have been uh, discussed uh, over the last days, I will give the, the word to, uh, uh, to Bruno Germontres, uh, who can lead uh, prepare this, uh, this event here at uh, Vivendi, uh, working by uh, Universal Production Music. Hello, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Bruno Germontpré. I'm in charge of uh, radio for the library music uh, department, uh, a part of uh, Universal Music uh, France. Universal Music Group is a part of Vivendi, so that's why we are under the Vivendi Dome uh, in Paris at the headquarters. Uh, we are very happy to, um, to be alongside the Salon de la Radio and Radio, radio 2.0 uh, for uh, talking about new uh, tenancies, new uses uh, with uh, radio. Uh, as labels, as uh, publishers, uh, we are very happy to, uh, to go further on these matters, especially on the meta media data. I think uh, I'm going to learn many, many things this morning <laughs> uh, after the, the talks. Um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Claudia uh, from the Vivendi uh, team uh, who set up the, this morning this event on the technological side and I think it, everything going to be all right and she was very involved in this uh, setting so thank you so much Claudia. Um, just a few words to explain why we are uh, at Vivendi because uh, I joined the committee of the Salon Radio at the uh, early this uh, early year, and uh, Nicola and Xavier were looking for a place to set up this webinar during the, the ISMIR, and we were very happy to offer this solution because that's very nice and <laughs> central in, in Paris. So uh, it means that we are very aware about these new these new tendencies uh, regarding radio, and I think uh, that's very exciting matters, and that's the future. So I will let the people talk just right now. Have a good morning. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bruno. So
So now, without waiting uh, anymore, I would like to, uh, uh, to welcome Eric Humphrey. Um, so Eric is part of the, the board, the organization of uh, ISMIR, I think, as the secretary. Yeah. Uh, and so I've been very busy over the last days uh, with uh, the, the ISMIR conventions. And I, I think it was interesting to get his feeling uh, about the, uh, what happened in the space of uh, music data, let's say. And uh, also, as uh, Eric is uh, uh, very deeply involved in the machine learning, uh, leading the development by, uh, by Spotify, to possibly, at the end of his presentation, because this is the purpose of today, is to be very practical in the use of data and uh, to, to, to put in, a, uh, let's say, on, on the top the, the value it can generate, to give a few examples on uh, how uh, Spotify apply those uh, machine learning techniques or, or data uh, uh, to generate value uh, for, the, for the users, possibly also for the announcers as well. Eric, this is yours. Nicholas, thank you. All right. All right, well, that's getting fired up. Uh, as Nicholas said, my name is Eric Humphrey. Uh, I spend my days as a machine learning engineering manager at Spotify. Uh, but today, I'll be speaking on behalf of the uh, International Society for Music Information Retrieval, where I've been the acting secretary for several years now. Um, and yeah, this week we had a conference in Paris hosted by uh, IRCAM Telecom Paris Tech uh, and graciously hosted at Cité University down the 13th, 14th, and um, all So it brought together researchers from all across the globe. We are an international community um, coming from you know, Taiwan, uh, Uruguay, United States. Um, Okay, as I said, this is a brief introduction. I'm primarily going to be speaking um, from the perspective of the community, and I wanted to highlight just what we're about, where we're going, some challenges we've had, and some of the use cases, as Nicholas um, mentioned, that we tackle. So, as I mentioned, we are a nonprofit uh, scientific organization. Um, so, if you think about value creation, uh, value is primarily on the what. We tend to focus on the how we solve these problems. Um, so, we look to uh, communities like this to identify the challenges that we can help bring data and machine learning to help solve. Just a moment. I believe that was me. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. We are an interdisciplinary field. We bring together researchers from many, many different disciplines. Our first conference was in the year 2000, um, br bringing together folks from digital libraries, um, music theory, computer science, psychology, uh, but more recently, folks from the uh, machine learning communities, as that's really taken off. And the amount of data that we have at um, our fingertips is really scaled. Okay. We can do this. Um, so yeah, just a quick flyover. I'm the secretary on the board. Uh, you can see that the board is composed of people who uh, you know, are truly international. Um, our objectives as a community are to foster the exchange of ideas among members of the community, um, primarily around music information. So music information really encompasses everything from the audio signal to what users do with the signal um, to how people talk about it, blogs on the internet, uh, pitchfork and the like. Is that working now? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, we have the conferences to simulate research, development, and improvement of uh, teaching and education. Um, because originally the field was bored out of academia. I will stop floating around so much. Um, 
Yes, so we publish our findings, we cooperate with representatives of other organizations to bring other ideas in and also share out, and really we try to help support and encourage diversity um, among both our fields and the topics that we cover. Um, you can see that we've been growing over time and we're a relatively impactful scientific community in computer science and these, these things. Uh, so we actually, as Nicholas mentioned, we had upwards of 450 attendees this year, uh, making it the largest as mayor to date. Um, we have a wide-reaching online presence. Uh, this is a screen grab of our website. Um, you can see that next year we'll be in Delft. I have a beautiful picture of the canals from the Netherlands. Um, but we also have a journal that we publish. Um, all of our proceedings are freely available. Uh, because we really prioritize open access of all this information, uh, we make it a point to make our proceedings, and now a lot of the talks from this week are all available online. Um, we are also very open when it comes to our source code and other kinds of things. This is the uh, society organization, but also researchers in the community tend to make their uh, source code and other things that they produce readily available. Um, this is a screen grab of our transactions. So now we have a longer form uh, journal to cover contributions that we've made to the scientific community. Uh, this is a view of the main plenary session uh, this week. So you can see we had a very packed house. Fast. Um, one of our initiatives that we're really proud of and I'm going to run to shortly is um, we've been making a very concerted effort to support women in the music information retrieval community. Um, so this has taken the form of industry sponsorships helping to alleviate the financial burden of attending international conferences while also we have a very uh, productive mentoring program where we pair senior members of the community both in academia and industry with uh, junior members or peers to be able to um, get feedback and support uh, and kind of talk through various issues or career development challenges that folks have been having. Um, we also have an increasing industry presence. Uh, so Deezer, who's supporting this event now, is also really involved. Spotify is really involved. We continue to publish. Um, and it's been really great to have much more crossover between industry and academia to help drive and keep the community focused on where value is created. Uh, and also we we play music together. So these are uh, two of the general chairs from this year's conference and then Cynthia, the general chair of next year's conference, rocking out on a boat on the Seine. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll be in Delft next year and we'll be in Montreal uh, in 2020. Uh, the conference usually happens at this time of year. Uh, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, but bringing it back to value creation, uh, some of the things that the community tends to focus on kind of fall into these three buckets. So the common one that we think about with music listening at scale is generally around content recommendation and user understanding. So you'll see a lot of work about how to generate playlists, how to use signals that users generate in kind of a natural byproduct of these platforms uh, to really drive discovery and enjoyment at scale. Um, but there are two other ones that kind of uh, take root in the community, and one is around transcription and visualization for how to learn. So education and performance, as you saw from the uh, banquet picture of the organizers playing music, uh, that deep passion for music drives education and bringing folks into the music making process. The flip side of that is also how can we develop intelligent technologies to create other kinds of maybe non-traditional uh, music creation experiences. So you'll see things like Musical.ly now, where you have interactive music experience for, for kids, um, primarily taken to the platform. Uh, Smule has done a lot of really interesting work with things like Magic Piano um, that kind of create lower barrier to entry uh, music engagement experiences. Um, there are some common challenges that we tend to face as more traditionally an academic community. Uh, one of the first ones is that music is non-trivial to create, but is very, very um, controlled in terms of copyright redistribution. From a scientific perspective, this is a pretty big hurdle. Um, music is also really intelligent behavior, which makes it really subjective. So one of the challenges that you will find when trying to create value from data at scale is that data tends to be more on the impersonal side, and a lot of machine learning technologies want to model these things objectively. There's been a lot of really great work to kind of uh, disentangle the, the more unique and nuanced slivers of information at scale. Uh, but the fact that everything in music experience and creation tends to be so subjective, it's actually one of the big hurdles for applying things that have worked really well for um, document retrieval or image labeling. Um, 
there's a lot of humanity bundled up in music uh, content. Uh, and finally, funding, in, especially in the United States, but more broadly is a little bit harder for uh, music research. But I wanted to call these out and hopefully try to encourage things a little bit more as we think about um, future value creation. Um, one of the key ones, and maybe this would help with some of the funding, is that because music is so fundamentally human, uh, it would only make sense that studying music and computationally studying music would help shine a light onto more intelligent, artificial intelligent technologies. Um, to truly understand music might require something resembling human intelligence. So that's a really encouraging, exciting, and inspiring avenue. Um, another one is that music and the role of music in a very technical or computer science field can also help with um, education, especially among younger uh, students, but also across different um, you know, cultural backgrounds or uh, life experiences and the like. Um, technology can be seen, especially among high school kids, as being a little bit of too far a uh, bridge to cross, but music and the emotional attachment to music can kind of help bridge that gap. And then finally, uh, creative music information retrieval is among one of the more uh, exciting things in the Izmir community. Um, really expanding the reach of people being able to both create and share music at scale will create some really interesting uh, usage patterns and signals. We've seen Smules start to pioneer this. Um, but as we look to where the future of a bi-directional um, communication medium is bringing us, you know, think about broadcast radio for the longest time was a one-way street. Um, now that we're starting to have more digital radio or other kinds of digital uh, communication channels, you now have a two-way street, which allows people to talk back. Um, everyone who's younger at this point expects that ability to interact and talk back. Uh, Clay Shirky has written some really amazing books about this, and to share an anecdote that he has, um, he was at a, having dinner at a friend's house. They sat the three-year-old daughter on the couch, they looked away, and she was behind the TV looking for the mouse, because putting on a DVD for a three-year-old didn't include her. And as we think about this and what this means for music creation going forward, where is the mouse for music engagement and creation? Um, it does not seem like much of a stretch that younger generations are going to look for where they fit into um, some of the music content that we provide. And with that, I would say thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I hope you, I suppose some, some of you, uh, I see that some of you uh, participated this week to, to Ismir. Uh, and I think it was a, a very interesting event to, uh, let's say, to, to introduce our, our, uh, our webinar today. Um, we are going now to have several use cases exposed about uh, uh, value creation uh, according to, to different angles from the, I would say, the, the media chain, uh, starting with uh, uh, so the, uh, a company called Symbal. So those people will be later uh, participating to the debate, but we, we ask them to, to give in a few minutes uh, an example, a concrete example of the use of, uh, of data. So I will call uh, uh, Matthias Robin, uh, with a uh, founder of uh, Symbals, which is a French company based in uh, in Bordeaux, uh, and specialized uh, in in the process of uh, of music data, and he will explain us a little bit more about uh, uh, the kind of value they uh, they offer. Matthias, hi, good morning. At Symbals, we deal with metadata every day for all our solutions, our products. We have uh, developed different tools, technological tools, like uh, machine learning, collaborative filtering, fingerprinting systems, audio analysis, uh, semantic matching too, and uh, it allows us to to provide some solutions for the industry like uh, uh, audio content recognition, 
automatic tagging on the global catalogs or music rights reporting, for example. So uh, how we deal with uh, metadata, we, we collect metadata from external API or from tracking in real time the radio worldwide, for example. We compute metadata uh, like uh, fingerprints or content descriptors, energy, harmony, like this. And uh, we collect some uh, behavior from streaming users to see if they, they, um, they like, uh, not they have like uh, with a, a button, but they like because they play it several times in the day. It's addiction, for example. It could be very uh, different from a day to the other day, or in the night or in the morning. And so we collect all, we compute, we cross the data, and we uh, match all this to provide some solutions for classification and indexation of the global database, for content recognition in the TV box or in the automotive, in the, in the cars, to provide recommendation systems, uh, what you can like at the moment with your friends, and uh, it's different with the children or like this and the trends in the world for artists you have to market or you have to push uh, in the front of your system uh, for the streaming platforms. So all is driven with metadata because uh, it's uh, usage metadata, content metadata. It could be professional metadata like ISRC. It's a, it could be a key. And when you have the, the good metadata, you can cross all them, all of them, and provide some, some tools, some solutions with value. For example, we have a solution for uh, TV set-top box, uh, free in France. The, and they wanted to have a ISRC, so identification, content recogn uh, recognition, but they wanted then to have an experience in the Deezer platform. So we had to cross the Deezer ID with the ISRC, which is done with the API, but sometimes it's with Spotify, sometimes it's with uh, YouTube. So we have to, to find with the content recognition, the, the, the content corresponding to the music on YouTube. Could be very difficult to cross, but yeah. So uh, content recognition for automotive solution too with after for the experience, the screen is uh, uh, animated with uh, the cover and the artist name and like this. Um, Real-time reporting of radio, it's used for right society solutions. So with a, a lot of metadata like ISRC, ISWC, or like this. And sometimes it's only used for the streaming platform or the global uh, database to manage the um, content um, meta metadata to avoid duplication for the storage of, of the data, for the aggregation of the metadata of usage. If you have uh, 10 times the same file, you, uh, you can't aggregate the meta metadata of usage. And so for example, simple uh, need from the car could be, oh, I love this music on the radio. I don't know what's the music, but I love it. And I want to see the concert. I want to be in live. So identification, just on the radio. So by fingerprinting, cross data with the database and the licensing of the cover. And the so fingerprinting. Geolocalization, ah, yeah, okay. Geolo geolocation of the user could be from mobile, from the car, to see what's uh, next to the user. Uh, Arena, it's the new uh, concert hall in Bordeaux, very good one. And uh, with the cross data of the ticketing database, like Digitic or 
you can see when it's down. Uh, an alternative is, is to say, no, Stromae don't, doesn't want to, to be in concert now, and so we provide some similar artists. It's a second experience. And so the value here, it's user experience, but marketing, yeah, it will be in the car, so the car could be very variable. And uh, you can sell some, uh, some tickets, for example. Yeah, it was a use case. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I'm Xavier Filiol. I'm co-organizing this webinar with Nicolas. So we're going to invite the next speaker, Philippe de Cotigny from uh, Muse Map. Uh, he will explain us uh, maybe something uh, around the uh, holistic and uh, data. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's your time. Okay, thank you. So <coughs> I will be uh, presenting not Musimac, not our product line. I got from Nicola some uh, subliminal message, use case, use case, use case. <laughs> so let's go to this slide and I will try to speak about it. So now imagine that you have a production music uh, catalogs and you want to sell that music. So it's a small catalog, 200,000 track, for example, not known, just production music that you want to sell to advertiser, to sound uh, track uh, for movie and so on. But uh, nobody know, know you. Nobody knows the title, the artists that are in your catalog. So how do you sell that kind of catalog? First, <coughs> so you need a tool, uh, that's a music match tool on our product line, that will be able for the advertiser to come and see you and say, OK, I, I would like to have a song that sounds like Adele, Hello from Adele, for example. C can you provide me some title out of your catalog? So that's audio similarity rec uh, recommendation. So we'll analyze the audio file, we'll get the catalogs, uh, and the return will be part of the small 200,000 tracks. That's something that is sounding similar. So that's a way for this small label to sell its content uh, to, um, uh, to advertiser, to uh, movie sound uh, track illustrator, and so on. <clears throat> Next step is, OK, Maybe the guy will come and see you, but have no idea what he wants. He just knows that he's looking for something romantic, soul, uh, jazzy, uh, something that you can be for a romantic dinner or whatever. So some tags, some, some idea of tagging. Uh, so, so then you need to have a cat your catalog, whatever is small or big, uh, tag correctly with a lot of uh, situation, genre, mood, weighted, because you don't want to be fully romantic or to want to be fully rock, but some percentage value. So with the Musimotion product, we are able to uh, analyze this catalog and get this advanced search that will recommend songs that are in this uh, spirit that is uh, expected for the advertising. Uh, so that's the second use case. But this use case is also very useful for a big label, big majors that want to uh, have their song clearly recognized by all the voice activated device. When you say to Alexa, play me a romantic song that is not too jazzy, but a little bit uh, soul or jazz, uh, or not jazz, not uh, with some piano, then if the music is not ta tagged correctly, the song will never show up in the response of the uh, search engine of Alexa. So that's why there is a need for tagging a big, a small for catalog for advertiser, but also big catalog for major. And for the last product, last use case is, okay, I got the song. Uh, is that song fitting with the uh, target audience I am expecting for with my product or with my brand? or and So, so ca can I have a, an idea of what is the psycho-emotion that will be the, the, the profile of the user that will really like that song. Uh, does it match my uh, target uh, for selling my product? So that's the Musimi product that extract uh, from the playlist you give as an input, or maybe I can use at least some of them. <laughs> yeah, this one, for example. Um, so 
to, to extract from the list of songs or list of songs that you play in track or uh, what, what could be the target audience of the product? No, it's not this one, it's this one, sorry. Is, is it fitting with the audience? So, last use case, for example, if you have an e-commerce site, you already have made every um, uh, clustering of your uh, population, of your uh, customer. You slice by age, by gender, by uh, situation, by geography, by whatever. But you, you, we, we can add an extra dimension, which will be, yeah, which will be what is a, the secure emotional profile of this user, so which will be able to refine the recommendation with smaller cluster of people. Uh, just because, based on their music test, so their playlists that you get from a, a Spotify Connect, a Deezer Connect, or from a game a contest that you put in your own place on your uh, site, uh, so to just fill up with some music test you, you like, and we will, you will earn a t-shirt or whatever, but in that way you are also knowing better your customer. So that's a Smusimi product. So that's three, four use case. Does that <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the presentation are, are available on uh, our website. It's uh, rr20.fr. Uh, so we, again, we are live right now. So we're going to uh, ask uh, Arthur Larre from Audion. So Audion is a brand new access house uh, uh, at tech solutions, and uh, it will present us what he's doing with the data. Uh, we are very happy to have him uh, on board because uh, uh, advertising is one of our main topic uh, for the webinar and for Radio 2.0. So we are happy to, to welcome you. Um, just a second to, 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 to set up the the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation. Maybe you can say some words first to, uh, about the, the, the short history, but uh, the, the meeting with, uh, with your, your partner. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I, I'm the, the co-founder of Audion, uh, which is a, an ad tech uh, launched uh, last year. So in fact, we are, we are very new. Uh, call ourselves a startup more, more than a company, but uh, but yes, yeah, so what we do uh, in um, in two words, so we provide both technical and technical solution and services uh, for the market. Um, and our main goal is to uh, bring value to digital audio advertising, which is quite a new media, uh, even if it's consumed uh, for several years now. But advertisers spend more and more money around digital audio. Um, and our main focus today is to bring innovation and value uh, to, to, to the market. Today, I wanted to present you um, a campaign that we run for Ford, uh, the, the car manufacturer, um, with the launch of the new Ford Fiesta Active. Um, as every new launch of, uh, of car, uh, especially for that kind of manufacturers, uh, you have a huge media plan uh, that takes place in France in June. Um, and one of the objectives uh, of the client was to use digital audio in both innovative way, but also uh, in order to measure the efficiency bring by, by this media. Um, as you probably know, um, in digital media now, every action that an advertiser is going to do is measurable and you have to uh, uh, calculate some kind of return on investment thanks to Google, Facebook and so on. Um, and now uh, you can do it on digital audio and that's, that's what we did. Um, just a quick overview of the, the or orchestration and what what is really interesting for, for us today is to see how audio data was um, useful for us on every stage of this uh, digital audio media campaign. So first of all, uh, we used the, the data um, for the targeting. Um, we used, of course, first-party data from all the big publishers uh, on the market, but we also make something that that is quite new for, for, for this kind of, of activation, is that we created 
custom radius around every car manufacturer uh, in France for Ford, which allows to uh, communicate uh, without loss, uh, which means that if you were in the area we targeted before, uh, you were uh, uh, eligible for, for this communication. The second, uh, second step we had was around the creative. Um, we built um, a technology uh, called Audion Creative, which is based, based on a other technology called DCO, that stands for Dynamic Creative Optimization. Um, dynamic Creative Optimization allows to adapt in real time the advertising uh, depending on the data we collect from a listener. Um, I will show you after what we did for Ford uh, on that uh, specific campaign. Um, of course, because we run uh, advertising through automated platforms, we collect a lot, a lot of data uh, that permits us to optimize in real time the media campaign in order to increase the, the performances. Just to give you uh, the number, we had more than 10 million data points uh, on that specific campaign uh, that were treated by both media traders and data analysts from Audion. And last but not least, we had the, the measurement process also based on data, but more specifically on mobile data um, because we collected a specific data when the listener was exposed to the audio ads on his mobile phone, and it's important to precise that. And afterwards, we had third-party partners specialized on geolocation who were able to track listeners through their, through their mobile devices uh, and calculate uh, a real uh, traffic in store uh, uh, on Ford uh, car dealership. Um, I'm not going to, to play the, the audio spots, uh, but just to, for you to understand, we have more than a thousand audio spots available for that campaign, just because we had two variable segments, dynamic segments, uh, integrated in that audio spot. So you have to understand that this is like a 30 seconds uh, audio advertising, uh, divided in three parts. The first part is uh, based on the uh, real-time weather detected by the location of the user. <laughs> so let's say that I get the ad right now in Paris, Today it's sunny, the, the ad will add with today the weather is beautiful. Then a generic uh, commercial uh, appears uh, with uh, the traditional spot for Ford in order to, to push and present the new Ford Fiesta Active. And at the end, we had a geolocation tag which allows to push the nearest car dealership based also on the location of the user. Um, with more than uh, 250 uh, car dealership recorded and uh, four uh, weather conditions, we, we get at the end a thousand audio spots um, that were delivered for this campaign. Um, and I think which is the most interesting thing about this campaign is the ability to measure the what we call the drive to store uplift again based on data and that's really uh, a key point uh, for us uh, because we try to bring innovation in every media campaign we, we execute but also with the technology we can provide to, to the market is that we were able to prove that digital audio, when it's um, um, treated with uh, innovation and technology, can bring value to the client, which is why he makes some advertising, of course, uh, and especially for, for drive to store uh, uplift, which is a, a key component for the retail industry, which is probably one of the, the biggest spender on, uh, on, uh, on advertising. Um, just to, to conclude, it was very short uh, use case, uh, but the idea of that use case is just to, 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 to show you that digital media around uh, audio advertising is really uh, increasing extremely quickly, um, and data-centric, um, both technology and activation uh, are really at the core of what we are looking uh, right now on, on the market. Uh, we deeply think that it's going to increase because every day there is more and more data uh, generating and creating by, by the user. And of course, in terms of media, it's also a huge opportunity to adapt more and more the message and to gain efficiency for both publisher, advertisers, but also the user because at, 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 the, at, the, at the end of the day, that's the user experience that will uh, uh, provide uh, efficiency for, for advertisers.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome Violaine, Violaine Di Meglio from Energy Global. So we see uh, ad tech, uh, new company, and uh, a lot of uh, development. So what about Energy, which is a historical group, but uh, maybe not the, the least uh, one uh, on tech and, uh, and development. Please update us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm really sorry because I don't have any presentation, uh, but I will try to explain you uh, where energy was and uh, what we want to do now. Uh, as you may know, uh, energy is uh, an a historical group in the audio and uh, in the uh, inventory invention in audio in France and uh, uh, in Europe, in fact. Um, we began quite early to uh, grab data. It was offline data. We have uh, al always be very, very uh, uh, focused on knowing our audience, uh, even if it was uh, offline audience. And uh, we always always have, you know, uh, uh, institute inside energy. Uh, which uh, uh, called quite 100 people every day to know uh, what they have like, uh, what is the best program program for them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, having data and grabbing data and using data has always been uh, a kind of a way of thinking of energy. Uh, with the new technology and, uh, of course, uh, uh, the uprise of the internet. Uh, the, uh, uh, the data uh, collection have been easier and, of course, uh, bigger than uh, ever. Um, we have decided quite uh, uh, from, for some quite time now to have a DMP uh, where we have plugged our uh, digital assets. So uh, all our sites have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, plugged with the DMP for... I think three years now, which is quite important in the only audio world. Uh, and uh, we are used to uh, work with the data in, for the editor, for the publisher, and for uh, the head house. Uh, I will focus on the head house because uh, Energy Global is the head house of the, the Energy Group. Uh, for the head house, the fact that uh, have, we had uh, DMP has been a huge. Uh, uh, advance uh, for our commercialization and our sales. Why? Because now uh, there isn't any sale without data. It could be socio-demographic data, it could be uh, knowing more the, um, uh, the choice of our uh, audience, but anyway, quite every uh, of our uh, campaign now have been with data. I will lie if I didn't tell you that uh, most of the campaign is focused on social demographic. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, this tendency will, uh, uh, um, will become more about the, the, the taste of the people, the way of their live. But for now, uh, the market is only focused on uh, uh, we want to have the famous women uh, who are responsible for the uh, uh, shops and for uh, every, uh, every goods. So, uh, of course, main of our campaign, we focus on that. But uh, we know that some brands are currently looking at uh, uh, have a wider view of what the data could bring them. For example, uh, uh, you have some brands like L'Oréal, but also Coca-Cola who are currently looking for way of style life uh, uh, data. It could be uh, uh, people who like to go out uh, often or people who like to uh, who have an environmentalist uh, point of view, etc., etc. And so uh, to um, uh, propose this, time of that, this kind of data to all our uh, clients, we have two ways. Of course, we have the DMP. But uh, we also work with uh, partners, 
second uh, data uh, uh, provider or third data provider. And what is really important now is that we have the tools who permit our uh, uh, media trader and our uh, CERO to propose this kind of operation. It wasn't uh, the, 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 the case, uh, I think, uh, uh, three or four years ago, but now it is quite easy for anyone to uh, focus on the audio campaign to a typical uh, 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 sample of population. And that is really, really new, and uh, uh, you could do uh, on the uh, you know, used way what we call the gré à gré, which is the, the, the HADOS campaign, but it also is possible now in programmatic. So the way we sell and the way we sell the data is really evol evolving now, and uh, it's like a revolutionary, and uh, we hope that to go on with this kind of sale, we are really uh, the strong believer on the importance of the data for the audience and for the uh, audio sale. I don't know. What it is. Thank you. Thank you, Yolande. Thank you very much. So, the next one, uh, yes, Isabelle from Radio France, Isabelle Cano. Um, so Radio France also have a, a strong uh, relationship with uh, with data, and uh, um, please update us about uh, the the next challenges for for a group like Radio France, working with labels, uh, working with all the data because you are working on the database, and uh, and there is a lot of new uh, system and new uh, relationship. So uh, please update us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Je vais m'exprimer en français. Pardon pour ceux qui sont anglais, mais voilà, c'est plus simple pour moi. Donc, euh, bien, on est producteur nous de métadonnées et nous sommes dépendants évidemment d'informations qu'on peut trouver à droite ou à gauche. Euh, voilà. Donc j'ai choisi d'échanger ce un cas sur euh, de l'importance des sources pour l'enrichissement de nos bases de données, particulièrement sur enregistrement, euh, les enregistrements musicaux. Euh, je vous rappelle un peu l'entreprise, donc Radio France. Radio France, c'est une radio, France Inter, France Bleu, avec 44 euh, radios locales, France Culture, France Musique, FIP, France Info, Move. Mais nous avons aussi la particularité d'avoir des formations musicales, puisque nous avons deux orchestres, l'Orchestre National de France et l'Orchestre Philharmonique, un chœur et une maîtrise. Alors, je travaille à la direction de la documentation et la direction de la documentation, il y a généralement, les gens connaissent à peu près la discothèque, mais il n'y a pas qu'une discothèque, puisque nous avons la documentation sonore musicale qui, où les documentalistes indexent tous les concerts et les émissions diffusées sur euh, France Musique, mais également euh, sur France Inter, les concerts de France Inter aussi. Et il y a une bibliothèque musicale qui contient des livres, des revues, des partitions et des dossiers thématiques. Nous avons une bibliothèque d'orchestre, puisque nous avons des formations musicales, où là, nous traitons euh, les matériaux musicaux pour les formations musicales. En d'autres termes, nous mettons à disposition de chaque musicien leur partition et évidemment le conducteur ou chef d'orchestre. Et enfin, la discothèque, où nous avons deux bases distinctes. Une base documentaire où nous avons euh, l'indexation des œuvres et des enregistrements, une indexation enrichie. Et depuis 2005, nous avons créé ce que nous, nous appelons la DNC, qui est la discothèque numérique centrale, dans laquelle on trouve donc les fichiers son, des métadonnées minimales que nous recevons de nos fournisseurs et euh, des visuels de pochettes et des livrets. Les métadonnées minimales, bon, j'ai dit qu'on les reçoit de nos fournisseurs, mais vous savez que nous avons un fonds assez riche et évidemment, nous numérisons en interne, euh, selon les demandes de nos antennes, nous numérisons notre fonds. Cette numérisation est faite par le personnel de Radio France. Alors, quelques chiffres. 1 200 000 disques physiques dans notre collection. Nous en sommes aujourd'hui à 219 500 albums numérique dans notre DNC 
et 2 400 000 titres numériques. Alors, je le disais à l'instant, nous avons plusieurs sources pour alimenter cette discothèque numérique, soit la numérisation et l'indexation en interne. Mais euh, depuis 2005, nous avons créé cette base. Nous l'avons d'abord alimenté euh, de façon externe par Music Center, puisqu'on recevait les nouveautés singles. Et euh, fin des années 2000, nous avons négocié avec des fournisseurs, des labels, afin de recevoir des flux. C'est ce que nous avons débuté avec Abeille. Malheureusement, Abeille euh, n'existe plus. Et nous, sommes donc, euh, nous recevons les flux de Idol, de Believe et Harmonia Mundi. Et nous attendons que d'autres viennent nous rejoindre. Euh, je le dis ici, aujourd'hui, chez Universal. Euh, euh, Qu'est-ce que je voulais vous dire Donc, nous recevons aussi euh, par des petits labels ou des artistes leurs titres par huit transferts. Et évidemment, nous sommes amenés à acquérir sur des plateformes commerciales. Je citerai principalement Cobuzz euh, et iTunes. Alors, quel est le public euh, de la discothèque alors, ce sont évidemment des collaborateurs de Radio France. Nous ne mettons, à nous mettons évidemment pas à disposition nos titres euh, hors les murs de Radio France. Nous travaillons pour les programmateurs, des producteurs, des journalistes, des réalisateurs et accessoirement pour les musiciens des formations musicales où là, le besoin est autre. Eux, ça va être pour découvrir une œuvre ou plusieurs interprétations d'œuvres avant de, de, avant de jouer. Alors, je vais beaucoup insister sur nos besoins en métadonnées parce que nous travaillons dans un média et la musique, elle a plusieurs fonctions dans un média. Quand on travaille pour un programmateur musical, ce n'est pas nous qui intervenons sur ses choix. En revanche, il va avoir besoin de critères de recherche pour construire sa playlist. Alors, on va distinguer les playlists de nouveautés des antennes. Je pense notamment à la playlist de France Inter. Et aujourd'hui, par le développement des web radios, on est dans un autre type de playlist avec vraiment des enchaînements de titres. Euh, je, si je pense par exemple aux web radios de France Musique euh, que nous avons créées, où là, ce sont des, des heures et des heures et des heures de musique qui s'enchaînent. Il faut donc pour le programmateur des critères de sélection et de choix très fins pour pouvoir faire ces, ces enchaînements. Alors, nous développons les thématiques, hein, des concepts, des personnes et des lieux. Les thématiques sont précieuses. Je vais donner plutôt le cas des émissions de France Culture. Ce ne sont pas des émissions musicales. En revanche, il y a un thème et on nous demande, on demande aux documentalistes de trouver une musique qui puisse illustrer ce thème. Nous avons besoin impérativement des dates d'enregistrement, de composition, de création et de publication des œuvres, de notions de période des œuvres. Pour les instruments, évidemment, nous avons besoin de leur nom, que nous gérons par famille. On a besoin de savoir si ce sont des instruments anciens et si ce sont des instruments anciens, quel est le nom du facteur d'instrument et quelle est l'année de création de l'instrument nous avons besoin de lieux et contextes d'enregistrement, de création ou de publication. Alors, il y a le pays, mais on ne se contente pas du pays. Nous avons besoin de la ville et de la salle ou du lieu précis où a lieu cet enregistrement. Tout ça est géré par des référentiels derrière. Évidemment, les genres musicaux, comme tout le monde, mais alors avec une grande granularité, sachant que nous embrassons évidemment tous les genres musicaux. Par ailleurs, pour les, art les artistes, ben évidemment, nous avons besoin d'éléments biographiques, de savoir euh, quelle année ils sont nés, pour ceux, pour ceux qui sont décédés en quelle année, d'où ils viennent, puisque nous indexons la, la musique, y compris les musiques euh, urbaines, en précisant généralement quel est le pays associé au groupe ou à l'artiste. Le rôle tenu par les interprètes, là je pense particulièrement à l'opéra, les tessitures des interprètes, Évidemment, les formations musicales, on a, nous détaillons si c'est un solo, un duo, un trio. Les langues d'interprétation sont aussi précieuses. 
et enfin des informations sur les reprises des titres par les artistes ou les samples. Euh, concernant les thématiques, pour nous, il est extrêmement important. Évidemment, ça nous facilite la vie quand nous avons un document qui comporte les textes des chansons euh, ou le synopsis ou l'argument pour la musique, pour les opéras ou l'argument si c'est une musique de ballet. Alors, euh, pour faire tout ça, évidemment, on a besoin d'une source. Il ne suffit pas d'écouter un titre musical. Ce serait merveilleux pour, pour en déterminer tous ces vecteurs. Alors, c'est là que je profite de cette audience pour dire, mais la dématérialisation du disque en question, où est-ce que nous trouvons, parce qu'on trouve encore, mais où est-ce que je, je me projette, on va en venir, où trouvons-nous ces informations par avant Eh bien, de façon très utile, dans les livrets qui accompagnaient, ou qui accompagnent encore parfois, les vinyles et les CD. Donc, vous voyez où je veux en venir, on est dans une quête de la dématérialisation à Radio France. Depuis 2005, nous avons emprunté ce chemin et nous nous apercevons, nous, que nous appauvrissons le, le contenu que nous sommes à, enfin, tenus d'apporter aux professionnels de Radio France parce que nous n'avons plus cet objet primordial on pourrait peut-être aller les chercher encore sur des blogs, sur les réseaux sociaux. On pourrait parler de la presse musicale, mais je ne suis pas sûre qu'elle soit en très grande forme, la presse musicale. Donc, voilà. Rendez-nous les livrets quand vous nous livrez les, les fichiers. Et je finirai ainsi. Donc, la richesse des métadonnées est indispensable à la recommandation, qu'elle soit le fait d'un humain ou d'une machine. Merci. Merci Isabelle, thank you. Um, so this uh, slide desk will be will be available also on the uh, Radio 2.0 platform if you want to uh, further explore it uh, later at home. Um, now I would like to uh, to welcome uh, Genael Collet uh, from the UBU. Um, so the UBU is the European Broadcasting Union, uh, l'Union uh, Européenne des, de Radio Diffusion et Télédiffusion, donc qui regroupe les, principalement des entités publiques uh, en son sein. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'ils ont monté depuis quelques années un groupe de travail sur uh, le big data. Uh, et donc, ils, ils ont déjà mené la réflexion au niveau d'un certain nombre de, de grands acteurs européens de radio et de télévision, la, la vidéo étant quand même un, un, un point fort dans ce domaine des datas, euh, et en sont à un stade d'implémenter de, des, des expériences réussies dans différents pays. Euh, donc ce que j'avais demandé à, à, à Genaël, qui, qui était leader de, de ce groupe jusqu'à jusqu l'été, c'était de nous présenter un petit peu des, des use cases, uh, to present some, uh, some examples among the, the members of the, the UP, UBU in Europe, uh, radio and TV, about the, the use of data, how they leverage data. Um, so there are different, uh, I would say, tasks uh, on the go, uh, and different examples in uh, several countries uh, that they try to uh, duplicate, uh, and uh, uh, we thought it was interesting to get this European uh, uh, overview. Merci beaucoup. Euh, bonjour. Et euh, donc, comme vient de l'expliquer Nicolas, um, I, I will uh, uh, switch to English. Actually, uh, my name is Genal Collet. I work for the European Broadcasting Union, which is the alliance of public service broadcasters. So I'm not going to present you a product. I'm not going uh, to represent a company either, but I'm going to, to tell you more about this journey that um, we've been embarking on, which is called the uh, Big Data Initiative, and which I had the honor to, thank you, to set up and to run for the last three years. So this is the EBU, just in a nutshell, you can see we have TV channels, radio stations, um, exclusive online linear services, and uh, simulcast uh, Uh, services as well. Uh, together, our members, the public service broadcasters, meaning Radio France in France, but also France Television, the BBC, Swedish Radio, whatever, uh, throughout Europe, 
in actually 56 countries, um, they reach together up to uh, 1.05 billion uh, viewers or listeners. So quite a big audience. We are legacy media, um, and uh, 15 years ago, the world was very simple. Actually, it was beautiful. There were only two categories in the market, the public service broadcasters and the uh, commercial broadcasters. Um, of course, we were already present online, but that was not as developed as today, as everyone knows. Then, let's jump um, to 2012 um, as one, one important year, but all the next years were important as well. Um, we have some, some big changes in the market, of course, converging markets, meaning that data companies enter the content production market, um, but also that startups start uh, um, being relevant for the audiovisual and audio sector. And, uh, of course, the telcos as well, uh, with some kind of uh, market consolidation. That all blurs the lines. Uh, in 2012, we have NRK, our public service broadcaster in Norway, that partners with Netflix to produce the first ever um, production of Netflix, Lily Hammer. It's about an ex-mafia gangster who wants to hide in the little town of Lillehammer in Norway, but of course um, it's a comedy show and uh, lots of, he gets into a lot of trouble. Uh, anyway, as public service broadcaster, as this news was kind of looked with a lot of interest and mixed feelings really. Should we partner with Netflix or not? Should we partner with Spotify, Deezer in the radio uh, world or not? And under what conditions? At the same time, at European level, the GDPR proposal was launched, and that, of course, was also a game changer into, um, in the way we, we, we are perceived by our audiences and the way we must look at them and cater for, for the best service possible um, for our audiences. The year after, um, ARD and the DF, the two public service broadcasters, um, received bad news that their project for a joint video tech, online media tech, uh, was rebuked um, on, um, on the ground of uh, competition issues. Uh, on the national market, they were considered to be too big and therefore too dominant, and therefore they were unable to set up this uh, promising project. At the same time, you, you have world... Um, global companies that propose the same thing but with different competition rules. So there is a kind of uneven competition issue there that we needed to uh, take into account. And um, in the next year, 2014, Netflix was present in 40 countries. And that expansion became bigger by the day. That was kind of a wake-up call for our public service broadcasters, our members. Let's do something. Actually, we are legacy media. We are not data companies. We will never be. We do not tend to be uh, data companies. We are not even sometimes, in, in actually quite a number of times, we are not even um, advertising uh, ad funded. So we do not have this incentive to, to have a native advertising and link it to data to uh, optimize our revenues. Nevertheless, this is a must. This is not, no longer nice to have. This is a must. We need to look at data and become more data enabled. And that's how the Big Data Initiative um, was born, really. So what do, we, do we, we aim to do with this initiative? It's meant for our members uh, to um, strengthen their, their business models, to use the strong and diverse brands that they already have and the tremendous catalog that they already have um, and better exploit it. And, of course, uh, focus on our, uh, their, their audiences uh, to uh, aim at better reach and better loyalty of their audiences. So that, these were the, the three main points that came out of the brainstorming session that we had uh, mid-2015. Um, then we decided to get organized 
uh, around four workflows or work streams, if you like. One in red is very, very important. It's trust, um, meaning that we want our audiences to have and maintain a trustful relationship with us, public service broadcasters, radios. Um, we want to develop accurate privacy policies, for instance, and uh, privacy by designs, tools, products, services. Distribution is more to do with single sign-on, for instance, as a tool to better um, link to, to, to do the dem demand of the audiences and better know your audiences at the same time. Um, and it can also be uh, used for uh, in conjunction with recommendation systems, of course, to better personalize your services. Um, intelligence, what is made by that is uh, understanding the market, basically, but also understanding the audience, and we have audio analysts, uh, sorry, audience analysts that um, work on a single currency that would uh, reconcile uh, broadcast and online uh, audience uh, measuring. And finally, we have production. Data can also give you useful information to make informed choices on programming, on scheduling. And there is also a specific part under that production bit, which is the data journalism. That is very important for us as part of our news activities. Um, in order to address all these topics, it's quite vast, as you can see, uh, we needed an interdisciplinary team. And so we've decided to, to, to work together at EBU level within the EBU staff uh, with people from legal departments, technology and innovation, media, meaning production, um, and uh, MIS, Media Intelligence Services, uh, as regards that uh, fourth uh, quarter. Um, but we also work very much in conjunction with our members. We have a, a team of um, members from the ZDF in Germany, from and Deutsche Welle in Germany, uh, BBC um, in the UK, as you know, uh, from uh, uh, RTBF in Belgium, and so on and so forth, RTE in Ireland, um, and so on and so forth, and they are part of a steering group. Uh, they are really the decision makers in terms of they know what their needs are and they know what their priority actions should be. So what would that be? Um, together with them, we have, they have set up actually their objectives, level up the members inside because we were not at the forefront of this um, transformation. So there was a clear need uh, to level up the inside. Uh, and we have been doing this uh, via uh, yearly uh, conferences, uh, big data weeks that we made also in in partnership with um, uh, other organizations, uh, be it in the advertising uh, industry or uh, ECTA, uh, or this year with the Media Road Consortium, which is a consortium um, uh, active in uh, R&D uh, in the field. Uh, and um, provide a forum for sharing expertise that's more operational, hands-on level, with thematic workshops. We had one on SSOs, we had one on algorithm and society, our societal role. Um, we had one on GDPR compliance, and so on and so forth. Then disseminate information uh, via reports and newsletters. We have a newsletter that is issued every other month. Uh, and uh, raise our profile, also pass on messages as regards our needs um, in terms of both regulatory and, uh, and uh, funding needs uh, to policymakers. I'm based in Brussels. This is uh, more focused on EU policy making, really. But we could hear uh, from the previous speakers that some people do really have issues with access to data, for instance. Um, this is something that is up on the agenda of uh, the European um, Union right now with a draft regulation on um, 
platform to business relations. Uh, we have the e-privacy regulation that is already in the pipeline, or also in the pipeline. One concrete example of uh, how uh, some members have evolved over those years and since inception of this initiative, of course it's also and primarily their own work in-house, but, um, but the big data initiative is here to mutualize and pool resources and mutualize the uh, sharing of experience. So, um, OVO, the uh, uh, online service of uh, the RTBF in Belgium, um, has developed an SSO that has become mandatory in the second phase and linked to, I come back to the regulatory aspect, linked to the effect of a uh, new EU law on portability um, of content that enables you uh, as consumer to enjoy your favorite music or your favorite program um, uh, that would be broadcast in your country to enjoy it abroad throughout Europe whenever you travel uh, abroad. Um, that link to the technology of a mandatory SSO enables all the SSO uh, uh, account holders of OVO to benefit from their programs throughout Europe. So now OVO is available uh, throughout Europe. That's since last spring, actually. And other members, the RAI in Italy and others, are uh, getting interested in knowing what are the results of that. Is it good? Is it not good? Have you lost any, uh, any uh, account holders or not? Um, is, are, are people satisfied? How, how much did it cost you? How long did it take to put it in place? These kind of questions. So now data has become a strategic priority uh, for our members. This is new. It is 55% this year. Uh, it was only uh, 31 last year, so this is a major move, really. Uh, for another 30%, it remains important. It was already important, that is quite steady. And uh, the number of uh, people who b believe it is not important has dramatically uh, fallen down. However, this is still very much work in progress, and the level of maturity of our members is very uneven. And this is why we are now entering a new phase with this project. Uh, this is uh, to further extend the, the community, to further build on the brand that we have developed, um, the big data initiative, but to, at the same time, diversify and cater for this uneven maturity level. So we will have workshops that will be more hands-on operational for those who are more advanced. Uh, for instance, there, is, there are plans to have one on KPIs um, in the coming months, uh, but there will be also um, more informative uh, workshops or events uh, for those who need to get interested. And here, this is less advanced member organizations, but also um, strategists, C-level executives that are targeted, as opposed to mid-management for the most advanced ones. And finally, we will strengthen the coordination with other projects or initiatives that we are having at CBU. Um, for instance, there is a working group on metadata. Since last February, there is a new group on radio archive and how to better valorize our archives. Um, and there is also a project called Peach, personalization for each, that is open to every member of the EBU and propose um, solutions, really, products uh, that are inner source and that everyone can improve or uh, adapt to their own needs. Uh, it's a, a SSO, a recommendation system, and at the same time, a data scientist uh, working group, expert group. So these are a few examples of what we are doing. Thank you very much. If you're interested, it's not for member only, so members only, so um, you're welcome to register for the um, newsletter or join our event. Thank you. I suggest you stay here. I will now call for, for the uh, past people to, to join the, the debate uh, here. This debate today uh, will be driven by uh, uh, Yvan Boudillet. So Yvan uh, is uh, uh, now leading the, the company The Link. Uh, he's a, a connector. <laughs> we like to, to call it like this uh, within the music tech ecosystem. Uh, he likes to, to bridge the, the creativity, 
uh, music, uh, innovation, uh, and business. Uh, and uh, he will now uh, run the, the discussion to explore it a little bit further, uh, some aspect of this uh, valuation uh, of uh, media based on data. This is yours. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, everyone, welcome. Uh, really pleased to moderate this panel today on this uh, really exciting and complex but uh, living topic of metadata use and data use uh, in media and, let's say, content environment. Uh, it seems it's, it was really interesting to get all of use cases, and I think we get a really diverse and complementary perspective of the topic from product. Uh, media, advertising, and I guess one of the common points of all of you, uh, what you bring uh, to the table is it seems that really user and usage can become central to pretty much everything we, we do uh, as professionals and in the, the way it is consumed today. So I would like to open uh, this uh, discussion with a point about how contextualization, personalization becomes pretty central in, in the, the, world, the world today of consumption, but from each of a perspective, as, as medias, as a te technology specialist, how you tackle that, this kind of challenge about con contextualizing and personalizing the experience, but still keeping the relevancy of your service, or your, of your technology, of your approach as a broadcaster, as a media. And I will, I will go to, to you, Violaine, uh, for energy. This kind of a bo uh, both side of the of the topic, contextualization and personalization from a user perspective. But as you are also especially working with brands, who are looking to targeting this engaged audience, how do you tackle that? Like um, the consumer journey that becomes more and more, let's say, contextualized or personalized. And by the way, how do the kind of experience by audio? Um, contextualizing also the advertising to the user. How, how do you do that and how do you approach that with data at the core of it? Uh, first, uh, I think that uh, we have to uh, remind that uh, now there is a, a new rule which is called uh, RGPD or GDPR and uh, uh, the cards have been redistributed. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the data uh, focused on audio is quite new uh, because uh, uh, on the digital it's a quite uh, a, a new topics which n which did not exist before and just at the beginning of the the the, the data uh, focused on audio there is this new rule and we can do what we used to uh, do basically, uh, because uh, 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 I'm speaking uh, on the uh, Hado's point of view, not on the energy group point of view. Um, now, um, when we sell data, uh, we have to uh, focus on the, the, the quality of the data, of course, but also what we could do and not do with the data. And it's really a new point, which uh, uh, makes us uh, uh, think about the new way to collect data, the new way to m make some marketing for our clients. Uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, uh, in every media, uh, the clients have first focused on the, I want to uh, uh, touch my, uh, the people who are able to buy my product. So uh, it was always uh, geocalized. And then uh, the uh, clients uh, wanted to focus on the people who really, really, really uh, have a, a, a special interest for their products. And in between, uh, we, I think that in some way, uh, we forgot to ask them if they are really interested to be focused. And now it's not the same. So of course we uh, uh, we do con contextualization, but because we are an offline media first, we always have done this. Of course we do geolocalization, but because uh, we are an offline media with 
delocalized ba based because we have some uh, radio specific for some region. So we are used to, and now this uh, uh, all, all all this mantra we have we are we are now uh, plugging it to the digital. And it's not a, a big revolutionary because we always have done the same before. It's not the same way to uh, do it, but it's the same kind of uh, uh, problematics. Thanks. Very interesting. Like to bring bo also back the regulatory, regulatory also uh, environment we are living, in. and also just remember that offline and the linear radio is still accurate and relevant today, mixed with data. It's not all all about playlisting and stuff because. Every time we tackle the data thing, we are always pushing the, the, the boundaries to, hey, the hyper-contextualized uh, experience, like I'm running and I'm listening to this music or this show, but still uh, the audience, like the user, are still uh, engaged in, uh, with like, the way radio is done today. And you have to mix the data-driven uh, advertising into a, a linear offline experience, so which is not challenging, this is what you do, but it's not all about the hyper-fragmented uh, consumption. It, it can be a mix of the two. Of course, and uh, uh, what uh, now, like I said before, there, there isn't any campaign without, uh, uh, without data. It's uh, on the digital, it's like uh, uh, the, the hair you, 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 you breathe. So it's, it's like common for us to work with data. It's often so, so, so demographics. It's often the, uh, the the gender and the age who are uh, focused uh, on the for the the, um, the main clients, and of course now we have the delocalization. But what what we see is that uh, um, more than to have the people who are who are going to uh, buy I don't know uh, uh, phone or the, the 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 clients are more interested by the way of the people live which is for us more interesting because as a media and uh, as a media with a, a, a strong focus on uh, 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 helping you know, uh, people to uh, have fun, to entertain, it's easier for us to, uh, when, when we are asked to uh, um, have some, uh, 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 so, so some campaign on, I want to have people who like music who like uh, uh, pop music, who like, I don't know, uh, uh, music of the 60s. And uh, uh, it's a new way and it's more, more and more contextualized. So it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, I think that clients uh, have tried to do, for example, I want to have uh, some people who are interested in the car which are uh, blue and uh, uh, with uh, this kind of this kind of uh, specificities, and in fact uh, the, the sample was so tiny, it was not interesting for the media and even for the clients. So now uh, maybe we will have a new age with uh, uh, a focus more on the way of life, and uh, uh, it is what is really interesting for us. Thanks, uh, Arthur. I will bring this question to you now. Um, not from a B2B or market perspective, but again, user perspective. From your point of view, potentially insight you got before launching the company and also right now through the campaigns and the, the inputs and outputs that comes through the campaigns. What is the expectation of the users? Like, do, how do they react to the kind of format you, you propose? And like intangible services, what they really expect? Like having a contextualized advertising based on whether is it something that resonates with the audience? and uh, Matthias also and uh, uh, Musema brought some e-commerce like up upsell opportunities like based on the context. Like, where do we go in this field? Like expectation from the user base right now. Um, yeah, definitely because once again, I think you have to think about the user experience first, even when it came to uh, advertising, and we noticed and and we we had the figure that that proved that prove it that. Um, once you personalize or even put the advertising in the right context, you just increase the, the performances um, and the, the efficiency of the media campaign. But if you think about that, it's quite logical. I mean, if you, uh, if you are in Paris and you're listening to uh, jazz songs every day, if you have an advertising that will uh, push uh, a store n the, which is near to you and that 
in this advertising you have like uh, a jazz music in the background. I mean, you just go further than a traditional radio ad, which is extremely generic, uh, standard, and uh, who has uh, as an objective to reach as much people as possible with more like repetition uh, scenarios. Um, and what uh, Violaine said uh, earlier is is quite true: is that radio and every traditional media made personalization and contextualization uh, since uh, a lot of time now. But was it was it? Uh, I it's interesting to see that digital uh, can bring more like individual personalization, uh, and also with all the data you can collect uh, and you can play on, uh, you can go really much more further than you, you do on tra traditional media. And for us, I mean, the, the, the objective is to have less advertising for the users, but more efficient, uh, which also uh, will allow for, for the user to spend more time on the content, to consume more, and at the end to, to have a, a better experience. Yeah, better experience is also, uh, I think, uh, a big challenge and uh, some strategic level discussion from the platforms and the media, whatever, to stay relevant and to keep en en engagement high with their audience. Uh, you, uh, you two, I think, uh, or Matthias first, but uh, you are working with platforms or, and medias. What are, when they come to you, they have many challenges from supply chain, reporting, tracking, but when it comes to experience, what they talk, about like what are the challenges for them to to keep this audience engaged in this big competition of YouTube slash Facebook slash Spotify slash traditional media? We are still like doing it, but how do you how do you play a role here? Um, a lot of things about metadata with streaming platforms. Um, at the beginning, for the database, it's not so much documented. We we talk about Radio France with very fine <laughs> uh, tags, and they. They have no, uh, not all the relevant tags. And so f for an experience like a uh, search engine, a uh, voice search engine, for example, uh, I want uh, some jazz. It's not so, so cool when uh, the metadata is not very, very quiet, uh, very precise and like this. And sometimes you have Brazilian music and it's okay for the French, French people. But when you are in Bra Brazil, you don't. You want uh, 50 tags of, of uh, Brazilian music. So for the worldwide uh, companies, it's a very big challenge. So uh, technologically, point of view, you have, uh, for example, uh, at Museum App uh, too, uh, some auto tagging uh, engine. Uh, you need some uh, editorial parts to to do some uh, manual tags, and then you can uh, extend the, the the tags. So it could be uh, this. Other part, it's usage data. Um, so what people like when they do sport, when they uh, uh, cook, when they, and so it's very contextual. So for this, for example, it's important for the flow, but it could be important for, for advertising too. So you have usage data, you have content data, you have uh, everywhere data, <laughs> and yeah. Could be mix, very uh, it's a mix, complex mix, but you, you try to make it as simple and as operable as possible. Uh, and you at Museum App, uh, how do you approach this kind of uh, experience from a tech and data point? Uh, because the experience is more the media uh, job and they engage and they uh, interact with the user, but you, what, what, how do you see a role to make this possible that to enable new kind of experiences that keep the user engaged, so it's about value, right? Because it's about most of the now models are going to subscription, or it's about audience. So, how do you also play your role in in this field with data at the core of it? Yeah. So, as Mathias says, that the, there is a real importance to get the catalog tag uh, as exhaustive as possible, because that really helps to do the advanced search and the selection of tracks and lists and so on. But what we also uh, have in uh, Museum App is. Uh, products that will be also uh, focus on what is the emotion of the user that will be listened to the list of songs uh, that is presented and try uh, pre psycho-emotional profile so try to find a place within the uh, uh, area of uh, you and yourself and you and the others uh, how you interact with others that's also something that uh, helps the advertising to be uh, this uh, 
played, if it's audio or display, if it's visual, that will be uh, matching more with the audience. So if you have a, a set of tracks that is more on the jazzy, uh, cool, uh, chill out uh, style, uh, next advertising may, may have more impact if you are uh, targeting the audience that are favor uh, uh, listening uh, this kind of music. If you are more rocky and so on, uh, hip hop or whatever, that's not the same uh, advertising that will have best impact just after your, uh, your so. so the fact that the catalog is tagged and from that catalog you can extract some uh, emotion uh, that will be raised to the people's mind heads uh, when listening to the next advertising that's something that we we, we develop with our museum product yeah really interesting and uh, going to you because I guess we discussed about like here on demand platforms and energy like commercial radio, so to speak, with advertising model, but when it comes to Radio France and uh, your mission also to be more at the core of prescription, and we mentioned, you mentioned the name editorial. What does it mean, like all this metadata thing? And I, uh, I, 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 li I like the, the end, like metadata for human to do their job and to do prescription to the machine, but uh, it's really how it is done internally and how it is pursued also from the team, like more uh, the use of data uh, from by the programmers themselves. How do, how do they use that? And may, also we discussed the topic, maybe we can bring it to the table, about the diversity, what is at stake with diversity of a catalog, because this, all this role of data and recommendation based on algorithm. So I guess use of data from the programmers to what it, your view about the future of uh, recommendation in the in the cultural space. Merci. Moi, je voudrais ajouter que très souvent on parle de la musique urbaine, musique populaire, et on parle rarement de la musique classique, qui, à mon avis, est un des parents pauvres en termes de recommandations. J'ai participé pendant quatre ans à un projet financé par l'ANR, pardon, un projet qui s'appelle Doremus, que nous venons de clôturer mardi de cette semaine. Doremus, c'était des... Ce sont des chercheurs, différents laboratoires, et on a rassemblé trois institutions qui sont la Bibliothèque nationale, la Philharmonie de Paris et Radio France. Faire de la recommandation, bon, c'est ce que j'ai montré, après les critères, les vecteurs pour recommander... Euh, effectivement, ça dépend de quel pays. Évidemment, si un Brésilien, on lui met juste un terme, il ne va pas être très content. Donc, il y a une diversité de vecteurs pour la recommandation. Et dans ce projet, en fait, nous avons modélisé c'est quoi, comment on modélise une œuvre musicale classique. Je parle de l'œuvre musicale classique parce qu'à mon sens, elle est la plus complexe à modéliser. Et si on ne modélise pas, ben, ce n'est pas à vous que je vais l'apprendre, il faut commencer par modéliser pour pouvoir après pouvoir parler aux machines, modéliser et faire le point sur tous les référentiels de vocabulaire dont nous disposons selon le genre musical que l'on traite. Donc, pour revenir sur le cas Radio France, euh, je pense que le, le besoin très fort en métadonnées est effectivement dans ces répertoires classiques et dans le jazz, mais aussi dans des documents sonores qu'on peut recevoir et en fait, moi, ce que je regrette beaucoup, euh, c'est pour ça que j'ai profité de votre invitation pour en parler, c'est que nous ne disposons plus de la matière. J'ai un regret pour nous, les établissements qui avons des collections patrimoniales, mais j'ai un regret aussi, pour, parce que moi, je suis une fanat de musique, euh, je pense qu'on est nombreux. Euh, Jusqu'alors, on avait un document écrit sur lequel nous pouvions apprendre beaucoup de choses, et notre apprentissage de la musique passait par les lectures de ces, de ces livrets. Et aujourd'hui, il me semble qu'on prive le public de cette connaissance, c'est-à-dire que nous avons tous des bases de connaissances. Elles vont être ces bases de connaissances dans des machines, mais restituer une proposition de playlist, c'est une forme de consommation de musique mais c'est une consommation de musique sans, euh, sans l'apprentissage de la connaissance autour. Voilà. Et je pense que l'intérêt des médias aujourd'hui, c'est quand on construit des playlists ou quand on fait une émission, il reste encore cette relation entre un humain qui prescrit et un autre humain. 
euh, pardon de vous dire ça, vous qui que construisez des, des, vous donnez les moyens de, de, de construire des playlists, mais euh, je pense que ça, c'est un enjeu majeur. Écouter de la musique sans savoir quelle est la connaissance qui vous autour, je trouve ça regrettable. Je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu. Merci beaucoup, c'est un point très intéressant. Et euh, on est entre la connaissance et l'intelligence, et de plus en plus, on va vers l'intelligence. Et c'est la culture versus le contenu. Et bon, après, c'est des sujets assez vastes. Switch back in English. I, I, have a, I think we need to move on. And I, I really have a point I want to raise and to have, have your thoughts, uh, all of you, and especially you. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, accessing the source of data, uh, and it comes usually from potentially producer, white owners, content creators. Whether it's not available, whether it's costly to make up happen. And then comes, because here we are to talk about value, but also then we need to talk about the value and the investment that is needed to make it happen. All of your work, um, you uh, especially, and also the, all the investment made by the media, the broadcasters, it's a lot of energy, it's a lot of resource, it's a lot of uh, time to make all this work, and potentially we don't know if it's going to work at the end, and we live in a landscape global, we know that. Like even in the art segment, Google Art Institute is like, digitalizing uh, the funds of the museums, and they do the same with books, and it's, there is a lot of question mark out there. Who is owning the data? Because they have the investment and the capability to do that. And uh, regarding, uh, sorry if I take some time, but I, I want to bring a contribution here. I've been involved, uh, when I, I was at uh, EMI Music, in a, in a commission um, led by uh, Ministry of Culture at that time. It was about uh, the digitalization of the repertoire. And it was a big question mark, like who, who starts to, to make this work and who invests in doing it and for what purpose? Commercial purpose, heritage purpose, cultural purpose? It was pretty um, not that easy to, to start. And then my question for you is not about, I don't want to know how many you invest or whatever, but for you, what are the key drivers to make this uh, big investment or big uh, technology uh, push Is this content driven, platform driven, or media driven? You see what I, what I want to go? It's like, are we living in a technology push led by the platforms, open, API, whatever? Or the, the broadcaster can have really a role to play, and I think they are doing their job here. Or also, there is an open data question. Music Brands is, is doing some really interesting uh, ex, uh, experimentation and they, in the field of metadata, and it's open. So, Content driven, platform driven, industry driven, your, your, your input will be super interesting to hear. And, and you first, I guess. Thank you. Maybe you will not be surprised if I answer everything is important. Um, platform driven, certainly the platforms are, are super important and we need to carefully look at uh, the modalities for partnerships. Um, there is a current growing belief among uh, public service uh, radios and TVs that we should really open up and partner with the outside world, startups or bigger uh, organizations, actually both. Uh, some have made the choice to be open, like the iPlayer, BBC iPlayer is present on Deezer, Spotify, uh, TuneIn and so on and so forth. Um, others are um, more um, cautious in their approach. Of course, there is a trade-off to find between a, a strong brand that needs to be um, preserved and, uh, and uh, the visibility, the, the, the outreach that you can get if you are present on platforms. So there is a delicate balance to be found here, but surely there are a number of good solutions. As regards content, um, speaking for my own um, sector, public service media, we are not uh, primarily driven by advertising revenues, um, but we have a public service mission to accomplish and to report on. We are accountable for that, and at the end of the day, um, depending on how we perform, we may be, uh, we, our members, public service broadcasters, may uh, be reconducted in their activities or not, so this is really crucial. One element of that is diversity. And uh, some years back, there was the fear that um, 
All this trend was going uh, contrary to diversity. All these discussions about the filter bubbles, actually, um, that uh, would be the necessary evil of this uh, um, develop technological development. In fact, we now believe that technology must ne never be mixed up with strategy and that data can uh, be a very useful tool to enhance diversity, actually. Uh, it can help um, leverage and give, give new life to underserved genres. Uh, it can also help reach out to uh, underserved public audiences. Um, and it can also be a, a good way of um, uh, trying and testing new formats. Um, I have an interesting example from SR, the Swedish radio. Um, they are very, very present, very good in the market, in the national market. And they wanted to use um, data uh, to develop their personalized uh, services in a way, and their recommendation system, in a way that would enhance diversity. So um, they now propose um, episode um, playlists. Uh, they propose uh, listening playlists and personalized uh, services, also interfaces. Um, they have decided to try their system of uh, content, um, uh, uh, content uh, filtering uh, for their algorithm uh, with two different actors. One is a startup, Comodo, and the other one is the Peach Consortium I talked about earlier, which is run jointly by the EBU and its members. And uh, on that basis, they will, they will check what's, what's uh, uh, best for them in terms of diversity. Now, when it comes to the episode uh, playlist, um, they had these uh, three goals to increase the listening volume in play, but also have a bigger audience for smaller shows and uh, uh, increase the listening diversity. They managed to grow the three uh, uh, indicators. And they had a fourth one, which is increasing loyalty. In the end, people like diversity. They were uh, uh, happy with this new type of offer. So diversity can be an asset too. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah by, about the artificial intelligence, yeah, you, you can um, uh, provide an algorithm with diversity. It's not a uh, sole problem. Uh, you can do random, for example, so it's diversity. But yeah, people have to like it. And the need um, from the streaming platform is uh, to be uh, pleased by, by the uh, main... by the. Um, Hold people, and so it's collaborative filtering that is used. So uh, ev everybody um, heard the same the same music, but you you can add some diversity parameters in a recommendation system. There is no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can use uh, yeah, psychological profiles. You can use uh, you can um, encourage classical music. Uh, you can use only the content uh, tags like uh, energy harmony or like this and so make link between heavy metal and jazz for example it, it could be but they don't uh, use it and they don't uh, uh, ask for it not not yet That's it. and i guess also it's a matter of uh, telling the story around that because Beyond the content, there's a push mode, like you get this content and after this one and on the playlist mode. On the radio, you get also a, an environment when someone is playing and tells a story behind it. And I guess uh, what is at stake with what you describe about the, getting also the, the, the leaflet or the book, uh, it's also about the story, the lyrics and how, how it has been done. And, so, but it's, it's coming too. Um, it's part of the metadata too. Uh, talking about context and going back to some more kind of a business talk, um, our data also can, you mentioned an example, Matthias, about uh, you are in the car, you listen to the radio, and you want, potentially, you have the opportunity to buy the ticket. Uh, who wants to jump in this, in, in this one? Uh, how do you make this happen, and does it work already? 
I guess it works on Spotify for music. It works not that much on Netflix, which is a closed environment. Do you see examples in your broadcast uh, media? Yes? Uh, Rai is developing a, uh, a project that goes along those lines, more or less, but they also want to uh, make the experience of the user uh, fluid in the sense that you may be in your kitchen listening to a radio program, then you have to stop because you need to go somewhere. You, you enter your car and then uh, you can uh, go on with the, the same uh, live um, program from where you stopped, actually. You can uh, start again and uh, you haven't missed anything. So that's one uh, other functionality that they are looking into, for instance. Yeah, because I think what is at stake also is like media becoming potentially not, not something potential mainly for pr uh, public uh, radio, but marketplace. There is the, the phenomena, the way around, like Amazon, the biggest marketplace on earth, becoming a media. Okay, with uh, Amazon Prime and neither voice control, and I want maybe to. Uh, close this uh, this great discussion with some more perspective uh, discussion about voice control and what it what it, that it means for all of you in your in your in your perspective and in terms of usage or in terms of technology recommendation for radio public radio for advertising what does it mean like advertising in a in a voice control environment how the hell it, does it work <laughs> that, that's that's a good question. Um, I saw uh, two weeks ago a uh, really interesting initiative from uh, from the US, of course, where vocal assistants are much more uh, common than that, uh, that in France at the moment. Um, and the idea was that uh, you had like an advertising uh, that was like more like a question for the user, um, and you can interact vocally uh, just to give an answer. Let's say that uh, the advertising said, do you want to know more about this product? The user say yes, I want to know more, or no, uh, I'm okay. And then if you said no, the content uh, continue. Uh, and if you said yes, you just start an interaction with the brand. Um, so that being said, so quite interesting to see that advertising, so we talk a lot about engagement around advertising, but this is true engagement uh, and physical engagement by, by the user. Uh, that being said, um, we have to watch very carefully um, because vocal assistant and vocal interaction uh, are placed into, let's say, closed environment at the moment. Um, and we, we have to watch very carefully uh, on where we can go about interaction because there is a, a huge filter called Amazon, Google, or Facebook, or even Apple uh, around around those devices. Uh, but I think yeah, it, there is a, a lot of opportunity around that, uh, and especially uh, around data, which is the the, the world of the day, uh, because vocal assistants make the the user experience seamless. So it will probably. Uh, uh, have a, a bigger captation around the data and so if we can use this data around content or even around advertising um, in a more intelligent way it will provide a, a lot of, of benefits uh, for, for the entire market definitely. Thanks. Uh, Philippe, maybe from uh, Museum Up, um, how do you approach this uh, new challenge or we'll, 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 let's say for, of voice control interface? And our data and the kind of data you, you manage is, becomes instrumental to, to the experience and to the services that are developing uh, right now on, on this kind of new interface. Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, so, uh, as I say, I'm, uh, as the use case I used before, the, the way you will speak to the device is natural language and you have many words to describe the music, many feelings, many uh, synonyms. So the, the more you tag with synonyms and so on, the more the music you want will appear. So that's a real challenge for labels and majors to, to get at that level, to be find, found by the, the engine. So th that's one of the uh, goals of our product. But uh, also, if we 
um, if you want to uh, make some intrusion in the listing profile or with some advertising, it's better that you find the right advertising, otherwise you will get rejected by this advertising. So the, the, the tuning between the advertising context and the feeling of the users that are listening to some of the previous track is also important, I think. So that's, that's why we have the third product to, to make the psycho-emotional. So in which emotion is the user, the listener currently? Can we make this interruption to sell something that is uh, in adequation with the uh, feelings? or just going completely away and say, okay, well, get, stop, I'm not interesting. So that, that's this kind of so of uh, matching that is important. And uh, a question for you, and we, we switch in French. Uh, dans ces interfaces de, de voice control, et ce que ça, ce que ça présage pour le, la, les usages à, à l'avenir, et on, on, je pense aussi aux nouvelles générations, et pour revenir sur le sujet, un exemple lié à la musique classique, est -ce que vous, comment, comment faire que dans, dans 10 ans, un... Un, un, quelqu'un demande je veux l'impromptu de Schubert quatrième mouvement au lieu juste de demander je veux une playlist cool pour faire la cuisine et on va lui jouer du Schubert l'impromptu vous voyez donc le rôle de, de votre, votre rôle de prescripteur pour faire connaître les œuvres de Schubert c'est intéressant que vous posiez cette question parce que ça nous fait revenir à ce projet d'Orémus où justement les trois établissements l'objectif c'était de créer une base de données d'œuvres. D'autant que la musique classique, le, le, la construction d'un titre est extrêmement plus complexe, parce que ce n'est pas un titre littéral, très souvent, c'est une forme musicale, ça va être une sonate, à qui on ajoute une tonalité en ré mineur, un numéro d'opus, opus 60, voire un numéro de, de catalogue que Shell 305, enfin voilà, c'est extrêmement complexe. On a des, des titres euh, qui sont en fait des mouvements à l'intérieur, et euh, toute l'idée c'était de construire cette base et cette base multilingue, parce que ça aussi, c'est important. Euh, si on s'adresse... Euh, D'ailleurs, j'en profite pour dire que tous les répertoires de musique classique avec une forme musicale et des tonalités, les plateformes, on les reçoit, c'est écrit en anglais. Donc nous, à Radio France, et documentalistes, on traduit tout pour que ce qui est exposé sur le site, les sites, ce soit écrit en français. Euh, alors effectivement, si on se projette dans les, une enceinte connectée, demain, je suis chez moi et je veux écouter un un extrait d'une sonate. Pour ça, il faut que tout soit absolument extrêmement bien détaillé et structuré dans une base. Parce que les algorithmes derrière, ce n'est pas en ayant tout écrit dans un champ texte qu'on va réussir quelque chose. Il y a des bases extrêmement euh, structurées derrière. Et moi, j'imagine bien l'avenir où, euh, justement, euh, j'ai un souhait de musique et euh, c'est moi qui parle à mon enceinte connectée et qui lui donne les critères. Ça, je, trouverais une exp... enfin, moi, je trouve que, personnellement, c'est l'expérience qui me tenterait le plus. Et dans le projet d'Orémus, l'équipe du laboratoire Eurecom a créé un système. Je vous invite à aller voir sur le site. Ça s'appelle Overture. Et tous les vecteurs de pondération, ils ont imaginé de les mettre à la disposition de, de l'amateur de musique qui lui-même va jouer sur des dates, va jouer sur une nationalité, va jouer sur une tonalité. Et je pense qu'en termes de comment dirais-je d'interaction avec les bases de données, enfin, je pense que ça peut être une des façons ludiques aussi, plutôt que ce soit la machine qui va nous qui nous offre, même si les algorithmes sont savants, je trouve que c'est une des expériences utilisateurs qui pourrait être intéressante. C'est un bon point à rendre aussi les interfaces ludiques et dans la phase d'éducation aux, aux, aux œuvres culturelles. Moi, j'ai des enfants, je pense qu'ils ils sont mieux. Euh, a priori euh, plus réceptifs à des œuvres de musique classique s'ils peuvent jouer avec la, la découverte par euh, orchestre, par corde, etc. Ce qui n'est pas évident, plutôt que par l'apprentissage la, plutôt savant. Uh, switching back to English, and maybe have, uh, Mathias and you uh, a closing word on this kind of new perspective opened by new interfaces, uh, voice control, but also car, new environments, and yeah, your, your vision about how, how the, the five years will look like. Uh, in, in this field and data central to that? Just now, uh, voice controls are in the house, in the car, and so you can ask some jazz, some, some cool music, some sport music, you can ask some lyrics, you can ask some Pont des Arts and it will be played, but you don't know what's played. Uh, so Pont des Arts, it's uh, Brassens, it's, no, it's La Seine. 
if you uh, try uh, on Deezer. So there is uh, all, all the metadata is flat and it's pr prioritized by the streaming platform and you don't know how. And so sometimes it's popularity only. So you can't find the, the, the French variety uh, you want uh, only by a comment just now. So perhaps the future it's some skills to discover classical music. So you ask some classical music, okay, what kind of music? So you have dialogue and you, um, you propose the impromptu. The impromptu. <laughs> you don't know what's the impromptu, perhaps, but he propose and then you can use some metadata very fine. But if you um, try to have it just uh, for the first uh, answer, it, it can't be. So, and, and just for the people, um, there is one other challenge because uh, the voice recognition is not a challenge. You use some APIs, existing ones, yeah, from IBM, uh, Google, but you have to adapt. And, uh, for example, uh, by phonetic. And you have a new metadata in Swing Platform or other, you have to translate all the titles, all the artist names, also it's a dictionary, and phonetic, because uh, you, otherwise you, you can't uh, reach some certain artists. So it's a new metadata, adaptation of the voice. Uh, and some actual experience, what's on, what's on radio, it's, it's, uh, you can't do it. And wh uh, where I can see this artist, it's, uh, it's uh, now. And I think potentially to be positive about the, this kind of machine versus human, there will be a room for the programmer and the, the, the people who have the knowledge of Radio France and elsewhere to be part of this process of this dialogue and the skills, to tell the story in a certain way, but in an interactive uh, new form. But anyway, uh, your, your view about these uh, new interfaces and new uh, challenges, opportunities uh, relying here? There is clearly a competition issue um, because uh, we don't really know how our content will be proposed, suggested uh, onto those uh, personal assistants. When it comes to voice activation as a technology, it's very interesting. Um, what comes to my mind is that it enables you to actually um, uh, and be more inclusive in the sense that those people who do not read yet or those people who are not digitally literate as, uh, uh, as much as others would be, thinking more of the silver economy, so to say, there. Um, it's very convenient for them to use these uh, voice activation tools. So it's, uh, it's a way also to, uh, to better serve them. Uh, and for instance, Wiley, uh, Ule in Finland, the Finnish public service broadcasters is investing a lot into this. They will truly believe in its future. Um, uh, the BBC iPlayer also wants to have, uh, they also want to have their, their system uh, in working with uh, voice activation uh, in the next years. Uh, so clearly there is an interest that is growing for that. And I would just say that um, one element that needs to be maintained is really the trust factor, because now consumers are more, more, more aware of uh, how their data are used, or at least the facts that their data are used in a way or another. We need to, uh, to maintain this trustful relationship, otherwise they will turn away from these new tremendous uh, tools. Thanks, really interesting because, uh, yeah, inclusion, I think it's something in diversity to preserve on the way. And but not losing the point of being efficient, factful, uh, engaged still. So really, thank you for all the insights. Uh, I will turn now to the to the audience. If they have some questions to our to our speakers, uh, specific to one of them, or just an open question to the panel. Any questions from from you guys? Don't be shy, please, please. Ah, oh, Vincent, any uh, question? No. Thousands, so it will be one by one. Uh, of maybe one question here? No. Okay, so I think this is time to wrap this up. Uh, and thank you again. And metadata is uh, 
is now a real thing. So keep, in, uh, keep inventing the future of media, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you, Yvon, as well, to, uh, to drive this uh, multi-facet uh, debate, okay? Because there, there have been a lot of way to, uh, to talk about uh, data and uh, even switching in different languages. So thank you to, to you as well. <laughs> okay, we will uh, uh, give you uh, the possibility to attend the next webinar. Uh, which is planned for next week, the 3rd of October at Mondial Auto, okay, the Paris uh, uh, Motor Show. Uh, and uh, it will be about the, the future of the audio within the car, okay, talking about uh, how to possibly reinvent uh, radio as consumed inside the car. And that will be the 3rd of October at uh, Mondial de Automobile. You can, be, uh, uh, you can uh, register to, uh, to meet us there or uh, follow this uh, possibly online, either live or on demand. Uh, we, we are working on it. So uh, I uh, take the opportunity also to thank uh, Connect On Air, the, the, plat the new platform on which we uh, we, we get those uh, webinars now available, uh, produced by uh, Broadcast Associé and La Lettre de la Radio. And a big thank you for our uh, for panels to uh, participate to these discussions. See you later. Bye-bye.